Hello, everyone. We will go ahead and get started. I see a few more people logging in here, but we'll go ahead. Thank you for joining us today for another international exchange opportunity. I am Sarah Sibley, the Vice President for Citizen Diplomacy at World Boston, and I welcome you to today's episode, Resiliency and Equity in Community-Driven Change. And welcome to our speakers, Dr. Stephen Flynn, Mr. Clement Menyathella, and Dr. Atia Martin. As you may know, World Boston is an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization with the mission of fostering international engagement and global cooperation. That mission is particularly important during this truly global time of a pandemic, even as we practice social distancing. So even though we're at home, maybe especially while we're at home, we strongly believe that while programs may change, the mission persists. Today's event is part of our ongoing virtual series called International Exchange in a Time of Isolation, which is designed as part of our ongoing citizen diplomacy work and focuses on the people-to-people -people contact and the human face of the international dynamics shaping our lives. Today, we'll be looking at an issue closer to home, but a global issue nonetheless. We hope you'll check out our upcoming virtual programs and learn more about World Boston at worldboston.org. We need your participation, and if you can help, your financial support to keep this essential mission going. In terms of housekeeping for our event today, we are using the webinar format of Zoom. Everyone but the speakers will be muted. If you want to see all the speakers at one time, click gallery view in the upper right hand corner. We are asking all questions to be put into the Q&A box, not the chat box, where I will be curating them for the 10 to 15 minute Q&A session after the 30 minute discussion. We are also using the raise hands function. So if you would like to be called on to ask your question aloud of the panelists, please do that. If you have your hand raised, our moderator will call upon you at an appropriate time. My colleague, Josh Bruno, manager of citizen diplomacy programs will be running the tech as our producer today. We are recording this event and will be sending the recording link on YouTube in an email follow-up. Feel free to visit our YouTube channel to see all of the recordings of this series, as well as some of our other World Boston events. Additionally, I do want to ask for your patience today with the cross-continent connection to South Africa. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers for this week's episode, a discussion of citizen-led movements around the globe, specifically the end of apartheid in South Africa and the recent Black Lives Matter protests across the US. Both of our panelists and our guest moderator are connected to the U.S. State Department sponsored International Visitor Leadership Program, or IVLP for short, which World Boston implements in our community. World Boston typically hosts about 800 international leaders each year, designing and implementing a professional exchange for them. Understandably, these in-person programs are on hold at the moment, at least through September. But we had the pleasure of hosting one of our speakers today, Mr. Clement Maniathella, a year ago on an IVLP Edward R. Murrow program for journalists from across the world engaged in both new and traditional broadcast media. Mr. Maniathella had professional appointments with Northeastern University's College of Art, Media, and Design Studio, Emerson College's Engagement Lab, PRX Podcast Garage, and the Christian Science Monitor. Today, we get to continue our exchange with Mr. Maniathella from his home in South Africa, where he is a political reporter and talk radio host for the Midday Report on 702 FM. Mr. Maniathella has interviewed senior politicians and industry leaders and has covered major stories, including, including the 2018 elections in Zimbabwe and the funeral service of former President Robert Mugabe and the 2014 elections in Lesotho. He's also traveled with President Cyril Ramaphosa, covering his state visits in countries such as China and India. Mr. Maniathella has presented a number of high profile live broadcasts, including the inauguration of President Cyril Ramaphosa, the funeral of Winnie Madiki Zella Mandela, and the State of the Nation Address. Mr. Maniathella's reporting appears on all eyewitness news platforms. From Boston, we have Dr. Atia Martin, who has been a citizen diplomat several times for our visiting IVLP groups to Boston. She also has an extensive background, but I will keep it short and sweet so we can hear from the panelists. My colleague will share the website links with all of the full bios of our speakers in the chat box for you. 
Dr. Martin has spent the last 16 years in federal and local government within intelligence, homeland security, emergency management, public health preparedness, and ultimately resilience. Dr. Martin is currently the CEO and founder of All Aces Inc. Additionally, she serves as a distinguished senior fellow at Northeastern University's Global Resilience Institute. Dr. Martin was the first chief resilience officer for the city of Boston as part of the 100 Resilient Cities Network. She led the development and implementation of Boston's first resilience strategy, which was the first one in the 100 Resilient Cities Network to make racial equity, social justice, and social cohesion the foundation of building resilience across the city. Resilient Boston as was selected as the best resiliency strategy of 2017, and the Center for American Progress featured it in its report, A Framework for Local Action on Climate Change. We are also delighted that the founding director of the Global Resilience Institute at Northeastern University, where Dr. Martin is affiliated, is joining us today as our discussion moderator, Dr. Stephen Flynn. Dr. Flynn has also served as a citizen diplomat, facilitating many IVLP group visits over recent years to the Global Resilience Institute. And he has participated in a World Boss Reverse Exchange Program to Manchester, UK. Dr. Flynn leads a major university-wide research initiative to inform and advance societal resilience in the face of growing human-made and naturally occurring turbulence. He is a professor of political science with affiliated faculty appointments in the College of Engineering and the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs. In 2008, he served as the lead Homeland Security Policy Advisor for the Presidential Transition Team for President Barack Obama. Dr. Flynn is also chair of the Massachusetts Port Authority Security Advisory Committee, an author, and a former commissioned officer in the U.S. Coast Guard for 20 years. As our moderator and panelists discuss for the next 30 minutes, I want to remind those of you who have recently joined the call that we are keeping attendees' mics muted. There will be time for Q&A after the 30-minute discussion, so please do send any questions you have in the Q&A box. And if you miss anything, don't worry, we will be sharing a recording on YouTube after the event concludes. In particular, we also ask that everyone please be patient with the transcontinental connection with South Africa here on Zoom. Over to you now, Dr. Flynn. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, and thanks all of you for joining uh, us today here. I have the real privilege to be the moderator for this event, so you're really going to learn a lot from uh, my colleagues, uh, Clement and Atia. Um, in setting this up, though, a bit, I first will say, you know, our timing is really uh, quite impeccable for, uh, for a uh, event on resilience and equity and community driven in no small part because of the tragic loss this weekend of an icon in our civil rights movement, John Lewis, uh, certainly brings to the forefront, you know, the ongoing work and that all the efforts that we're trying to uh, do, address on the issues of equity, you know, are standing on the shoulders of many who have uh, fought this battle for for a long, long time. Uh, in addition, of course, we have the COVID emergency that has reinforced the resilience imperative in a rather extraordinary way. And just in framing in terms of how we're approaching and think about it, and it's a little bit of a setup for our efforts today. You know, we look at basically the resilience imperative that the, the societal resilience that we're all aspiring to uh, ideally have to manage the kind of disruption like we're facing uh, today, it requires a balanced commitment to advancing essentially three things. First, individual, family, neighborhood, and community resilience. And then the resilience of the infrastructure and the systems that people rely on for their daily lives, like our public health system. And then a sustainable and equitable economy. Uh, countries are resilient in the face of a major disruption or disaster if they have strong social capital, they have infrastructure and systems that can sustain or rapidly recover function, and they possess adequate resources to cover losses and provide a social safety net. Now, to the degree that countries are limited in any one of these three overall capacities, their resilience will vary. But importantly, strength in one can often help uh, compensate for deficits in others. For instance, developing countries that possess significant levels of individual and community resilience can find often creative, low-cost ways to work around the loss of things like infrastructure function or limited resources. Indeed, there is much that developed countries can learn from less developed countries when it comes to bolstering 
greater levels of self-reliance. With respect to our topic here today, and particularly the issues of equity, it, it, we see this as core to that providing the social capital that's necessary for a community and a society to be resilient. If we are, if we are essentially a weak on that area, when we have a disruption, it accelerates the existing, the pre-existing trends. So if we're a fractionist, inequitable society, we will find that a disruption like a pandemic uh, that we're seeing now will, will in only exacerbate the trend. If the opposite holds, we're actually strong social capital, then put on distress, we often come together. There's greater social cohesion. There's greater reinforcement of the uh, values uh, uh, that we share, and we ultimately get to a better place, even in the face of, uh, of a trauma or a shock. It seems pretty clear that in the U.S. context, our picture is quite mixed uh, with respect to uh, uh, this issue, and we're especially seeing with regard to uh, the COVID-19 that it's having a disproportionate impact. Uh, on uh, as a public health uh, challenge for uh, uh, people of color in the underserved community, but also in terms of highlighting the degree to which inequity persists. The digital divide, for instance, estimate 40 million Americans don't have access to broadband. In this world where you're relying all on telemedicine, where education will be provided uh, through uh, remote means, uh, where, where the way in which we support each other is also increasingly dependent on the form we're using today, that being outside of the broadband, outside of the internet, unable to afford it, even if it's available around you, as is the case in urban areas, these equity issues are really going to become more pronounced and potentially more deadly uh, in, in a pandemic environment. So those are just some, some observations I have at the outset, but I'd like to now turn on this issue of particularly focusing on equity and, and how we move forward. Uh, first begin with, uh, uh, with, with uh, my colleague, uh, 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 Clement uh, Mantaniella. Um, uh, Clement, you've been, uh, as we know, as a political reporter uh, who's, uh, um, who's covered a number of events in Africa, but in this current context, we're really looking in, and we're interested to understand a, a perspective from South Africa. Um, if you could just give us a little bit of a primer of those who aren't that familiar with what was apartheid and when, uh, when did this policy begin and when did it end? Hmm. So uh, apartheid in, in South Africa, you know, began many decades ago and it was really a policy that favored um, white people based on the fact that they're white um, and really there were a number of legislations that were put in place um, you know black people were not allowed in certain areas they were not allowed to build homes in certain areas um, you know there was the 1913 land act where black people were removed from their own land and it was confiscated and, you know, they were then pushed to other areas that ended up being townships and informal settlements. You know, uh, some of the other legislations include, you know, the fact that, you know, black people were not allowed to be sitting next to white people. You know, if they are found in, in, in town, if they are found in, uh, in, in urban areas, they had to produce a, a pass. So you have to show your ID to show who you are and what are you doing in that particular neighborhood? So um, there are many, many other examples, but that's what really, what apartheid was. It was a system of segregation. It was a system that, you know, didn't appreciate black people, whether you look at the healthcare system, whether you look at the education system and the kind of education that black people had um, and, and, and were forced to be subjected to. So that's what the apartheid system was all about. It ended, you know, just after 1990, when the now late press, former president Nelson Mandela was released from prison and there were negotiations that were in place. Uh, you know, the now governing party in South Africa, the African National Congress, you know, some of their leaders met with the former, uh, you know, governing party at the time, the National Party, and they were discussing then the ways of transition the ways of you know trying to include black people in governance and yeah then we had a new constitution that was drafted um, and in 1994 we had our first democratically elected 
you know, black people were allowed to vote. And that's when, you know, Nelson Mandela, uh, the AC was voted into power and Nelson Mandela became the first democratically elected president of the country. And that's when really we saw the back end of apartheid. And then one of the things that happened shortly after President Mandela became was a, um, was a standing up a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, what was it designed to address and what, what, is, what are some of the maybe legacy issues that it has not successfully addressed? Mm. So the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission was established in around 1996. That's after Nelson Mandela was now elected uh, president of South Africa. It was meant to deal with the pain and the past that this country had gone through. And this was a platform where, you know, there were former, you know, apartheid president F.W. Botha, for instance, appeared before the commission. Um, there were other, you know, ministers beat of, you know, institutions or departments like police and security uh, that appeared. And this was a platform for people who were involved in heinous crimes against black people to come before the commission and one, admit to some of those crimes and say, this is what I was able to do. And then the commission was then going to, you know, rec make recommendations and, and, and say whether you know, they indemnify some of the people or whether some of the people need to face prosecution. So it was really a platform where um, it was supposed to provide peace. It was supposed to provide answers. You know, there were politicians that came to testify, but there were also families of the people that were killed during apartheid. There were families and loved ones of people that were brutalized by the apartheid force who were sitting in that commission and listening to you know, some of the devastating and brutal testimony of how their loved ones were actually murdered and how their loved ones were tortured and, and, and just buried. And you know, their loved ones never really knew you know, about you know, the, the, the passing um, of those people that were involved in, in fighting for freedom. So, that's really what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was supposed to do, provide that healing moment, but also provide accountability for the murders and the mistreatment you know, of, 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 of the black people that were fighting for freedom. It wasn't really able to, establish, uh, uh, to accomplish you know, what, what it was intended for and, and I would say at a hundred percent of course it's been able to do you know some of the work but when you look at where South Africa is today we still have the highest inequality um, in the country we still have apartheid maybe over as a system as a legislation as law but apartheid some argue is still very much still with us when you look at how you know, the urban areas are still, you know, dominated by white people and, you know, black people are still below the poverty line. Most of them, they're living in townships. They still get the substandard education, the substandard healthcare. So there's a lot that still needs to be, uh, that still needs to be accomplished. Uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission did the first part of the work, but the healing hasn't really occurred. Uh, the race relations in this country um, are still not at where they should be. There are people that are still in pain. There are people that haven't acknowledged their privilege, that haven't acknowledged the pain also that a lot of black people have gone through and they continue to go through as a result of the legacy of apartheid. And, and finally, there are still issues around the prosecution of people that were involved in the, the brutal acts during the apartheid government against people that were fighting for, for freedom or against just even ordinary uh, South Africans, be it black and white, uh, that were against the apartheid regime. So the Truth and Reconciliation Commission made recommendations, but when you look at what's been done with those recommendations and, and the prosecutions that were meant to be there, we haven't really seen that. And that's why the commissioners of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission have actually written to the president to ask 
why haven't there hasn't there been prosecution for people that were involved in those heinous crimes? You know, why has it, haven't the recommendations, some of the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission been implemented by government? In, in our current context with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic playing out, how, how are these, th th these unresolved issues uh, coming out of um, the reconcili uh, reconciliation efforts and the end of apartheid with all the limitations? How, how do you see it manifesting itself now in terms of the society's ability to manage the pandemic risk? Mm. So the pandemic has really exposed a lot of inequality. It's exposed the, the privilege that still exists with the minority group in the country. You know, it's exposed the devastating, it's exposed the devastating lives of the majority of people in the country. You can look at it, if you look at the health sector, for instance, our hospitals are incapacitated. Our public hospitals are struggling to cope right now with the number of COVID-19 cases um, that we are seeing you know, every single day. We are just about to approach the peak here in South Africa with COVID-19 infections. And you really see how you know, these public hospitals are struggling to cope. And a lot of people have to be, sometimes patients are sent, you know, sent home and they're not admitted in hospitals because there are simply no beds, enough beds that are available to admit them. It's a different picture with some of the private hospitals, um, you know, because, you know, that care there is almost guaranteed for people that have medical aid, that are able to pay for that level of care. And I know government is in discussions with, with you know, private hospitals here to make sure that maybe we can transfer you know, some of the patients who are in the public hospitals that may not necessarily have the money to pay for private health care uh, so that they're moved from public to private so that we allow for more available beds in the public hospitals. But that's again has shown and exposed that inequality when it comes to health care. You can take education as well as an instance, as an example. You know, our schools have been closed for some time. There's a now phased in approach where, you know, some grades are returning to school uh, and some are going to come in at a later stage. But while the schools were closed, government was trying to push for online learning. Uh, and not only government in the basic education, but also even in higher education with universities, um, they are learning from home. What that has done is also expose the inequality levels in this country. There are people that are not able to learn from home because they don't have the material that is needed. They don't have a laptop. They don't have data. Even if the university can make that available, they don't really have you know, the skills to operate that laptop because the schools that they went to in the villages, in the townships, don't have those resources to, um, you know, to, to, to educate the pupils in those schools about you know, the skills on how to use a computer, for instance. So what COVID-19 has done is really expose, once again, the high levels of inequality in this country and, and the big divide between the rich and the poor and the white and the black. Well, thank you for sharing. I want to turn now to Atia because um, I'm afraid very much uh, analogous uh, a sense of challenges here we're struggling with here in the United States, uh, as I mentioned at the outset. And Atia, I know you're working very directly on. But just as a stepping off point, you know, in the case of South Africa, you had almost a, a clean of sorts end of apartheid and announced of a new uh, uh, hopefully normal with a truth and reconciliation. The story here in the United States has been a much, much messier one. We've never had a truth and reconciliation uh, commission. We're seeing obviously this issue come to the forefront now. But is that something, uh, as you sort of look at uh, our trajectory uh, in the U.S. Uh, dealing with what was de facto apartheid as a big part of our country, 
where are we and where do we need to go to uh, uh, to address these longstanding issues? How's that for a, <laughs> for a big challenge in question? <laughs> It'll start off a Monday morning, Dr. Flynn. Yeah. <laughs> um, so first, um, I'd like to say thank you to Clement for um, providing that context um, and, and the challenges. I think there are a lot of parallels. Um, so the, the question being kind of, you know, are we ready for truth and re reconciliation here in America? Um, and the answer is no. Um, the first step is to acknowledge that we have a problem. And if we're not on the same page that there is a problem, we can't get to truth and reconciliation. Um, it's, it's, a, it's the precursor. Um, and so there's too much debate on whether or not there's still a problem here in America. And um, part of that is because we're, we're um, very low on our developmental spectrum in terms of talking about these issues in ways that are uh, that match the complexity, the reality of things. Um, so, you know, we oftentimes talk about um, racism in America in ways that are oversimplified, um, that are um, that are that that put people of color, um, especially in this context, black people. Um, in the position to constantly have to justify, you know, their experiences, you know, it's not enough, not, it's never enough in order to prove that it exists. Um, and part of that is because we don't really understand what racism is, or how it works, um, and that all of us are um, part of a larger system, the system that everyone keeps talking about, the system of racism, um, we are all a part of that system. Um, we develop the policies, we develop the structures, we develop the programs, we develop the culture and organizations, we put out media, people do those things. And so one, one opportunity um, that I've seen for us um, is when we slow down and we really understand how racism works and how we've all been um, taught to believe certain things about who Black people are, who Asian people are, who all these different people are, um, and how that ultimately um, has infected us in ways that it has been reinforced over generations and to the point where we don't even recognize when we're, when those assumptions um, and, and the, what those ways of thinking influence our behavior and our and, and the decisions we make. Um, and so being able, in order for us to get to that truth and reconciliation place, we really have to understand how we are all contributing to the problem. Um, and what are the opportunities for us to actually address the, the, the challenges that we face as a society? And then the last thing I'll say on this point is, you know, um, you're right, Dr. Flynn, that it has been um, messy, right, in America. And, and part of that messiness is um, that we don't really know our history. Um, we don't understand the, the depth and breadth of, of why our communities and why society looks the way it looks today. Um, we don't learn it in school and in absence of learning it in school, we then don't have the historical context necessary to make the best decisions about how we need to move forward. We, we're, we're not standing um, on nothing, we're standing on a whole mountain of historical context that helps us to understand how we got here. And if we ignore that historical context, we'll continue to do things that are ineffective, we'll continue to um, uh, not take ownership of our agency, power, responsibility as people and organizations in America. In, in this context, when we see what has happened um, this summer with the, uh, with the tragic murder of uh, George Floyd um, by, by uh, the Minneapolis police and the resultant movements that come here, there's the, the really citizen-led movements popping up and not just our major cities, but very small, many small communities around the country. Is it your sense that something may be changing here? And, and is the sort of citizen-led quality of these uh, efforts here going to be key to making uh, whatever, any progress uh, that we hope to make around this issue that, you know, very sadly as a society, we, we have not made the progress that we need to make? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I would say definitely um, yes. There is all there. We have a lot more power than we believe we have as people. Um, I think one one thing I want to reinforce: it, 
especially in the context of America. I don't know if people have ever heard the saying, um, when America gets a cold, black people get the flu. Um, and, and it's representative of this idea that um, it's not a black problem, it's not a people of color problem, that we're on the receiving end of the symptoms of this long history, the present day reinforcement of it, and really what it, it shows us is where the broken places are in our structures, in our systems, in our organizations. So I just wanted to add that context um, uh, around kind of everything I said before. And then in this, in this piece around, um, you know, citizen led movements, it's really the only movements that, um, that cause change in any society. Um, uh, and in America, um, I think we have, I think we're seeing the possibilities. We're seeing people um, taking the time to really learn and understand what the problems are. They're taking the time to really learn and understand um, what role they can play, right? Getting to action. We've, um, and I, I, I think where we're at right now um, is, is a precipice that can be um, a moment for change, tran transformational change. Or um, we could, we can make some missteps here. Um, and, and the missteps we can make are if we only see racism as um, the extreme. George Floyd, I see it with my eyes. I watch a man die at the hands of a um, law enforcement officer. That's the only, way, only definition of racism we understand. Then we'll make change, but it's not going to be the type of cross-cutting um, systems change, people change, culture shift that we need to have in order to move forward. And so on the spectrum of racism, George Floyd is at the most extreme end. Then there are the day-to-day, -day, um, almost death by a thousand paper cut experiences that um, people of color, um, and in this context, Black people in America experience on a multiple times a day. Um, everything from having to defend that you belong in a certain space, regardless of your level of education, how much money you make, any of those things. And I include myself in that category um, of being questioned about belonging somewhere, being questioned about um, whether or not you are qualified for things and no one else is asking anybody else these questions. Um, and so there are these onslaughts of experiences um, that all of us are are, are participating in, in some way, shape, or form that we need to also be looking at. And what is the role and responsibilities of organizations in creating environments that help to facilitate um, uh, better exchanges and interactions and cultures um, where um, all of our humanity can be respected, where we're using best practices um, mm -hmm. and instead of what we think we know about people. Um, and using best practices instead of what we assume about communities. Um, in that case, I'm talking about COVID-19. Um, you know, we, we, the, the, one of the challenges with racism <clears throat> and how it works is it oftentimes, um, because of all of the ideas behind it, it distracts us from the mission at hand. The mission at hand is to appropriately deal with COVID-19. But because people think no, um, uh, or, or they have these assumptions about who communities are and why they're getting COVID as opposed to what the data is showing us. Then we make decisions about who deserves what and how much of what they deserve as opposed to the best practices, which say put the resources, <clears throat> excuse me, put the resources where the hotspots are, where the greatest needs are. This, this, these things aren't um, rocket science. It's that we're so, we're so blinded by what we've been taught and what the assumptions are that we miss all of these opportunities and that includes bringing in community um, and grassroots efforts into decision making before we in government, business, nonprofit make decisions that are going to impact large groups of people um, on the other end. Yeah, absolutely. These challenges seem so daunting. Um, we've been involved at the Global Resilience Institute with a major effort working with each of the six New England states assessing some of the economic recovery challenges that are gonna be associated with hopefully coming out of the COVID-19 emergency. Of course, what makes it really challenging is its unknown duration. 
but we're really striking for the work that we've been doing, which is deep dives into communities across New England and talking with folks who are on the front lines as local officials in the nonprofit sector and social services sector, as well as the private sector, is the degree to which there's such a daunting gap between Let's say those of us, uh, many of us I expect on the call, who are able to work remotely, uh, our lives have been disrupted, but uh, we look at our, our 401ks and it's all coming along reasonably well. And, but there's this whole other uh, segment of our society that's unemployed, uh, who are facing food insecurity, who are facing uh, housing insecurity, uh, particularly likely to be pronounced after uh, some of the CARES Act uh, support if it doesn't get renewed in Congress. Uh, as we talked about the broadband internet disconnects, but almost the collapse of social services as well, uh, the faith-based and the nonprofit community that was stressed before COVID-19 serving an underserved population and now with orders of magnitude impact, many relying on volunteers who are senior citizens and, and, and so forth. And then we look at the health impacts that are disproportionate on uh, people of color and, and, and people who are uh, essentially in areas where access to health care is much more challenging. The loss of health insurance uh, with people who are unemployed and then, of course, undocumented um, uh, folks who, who didn't even ask us to many of the services. As you, see, as you look at these challenges in the Boston context uh, as well within the communities, what are you seeing uh, relative to um, what I've laid out? Because we actually haven't looked directly at Boston. We've looked at other communities all around uh, New England. But what, what are we seeing there? And what does that tell us about work that we need to do relative to addressing these, uh, these equity issues? Thank you for that. Um, so the the more succinct answer, I'm going to give more succinct answers, I promise. Um, so full disclosure, I am my nonprofit. So my business is All Aces Inc. and my nonprofit is Next Leadership Development Corporation. We are one of two organizations that are, in essence, the backbone for the Black Boston COVID-19 coalition. Um, we have uh, the purpose of the coalition is to uh, make sure that um, Black people in Boston get access to what they need, not just to barely survive through COVID-19, but that we seize this moment and this opportunity as a way to make the kind of changes that um, will address the root causes of why the disproportionate burden is there in the first place and to help folks um, land better than where we were before we started. Um, so that said, what I'm seeing in the community is kind of more of the same, um, more decisions being made about communities, about people without them being at the table, um, more, and, and, and I want to be explicit why that's so important, because that's, that's one of the main vehicles of oppression, right? You, you don't allow people to have voice or decisions in things that directly impact them. Um, and and just especially when they disproportionately impact them. Um, and so other people make decisions based on with no context. And, and, you, and it's not just about representation, that having people who look like community at the table, but actually engaging with the community is an important part of this. And I see government and other folks who are starting funds and all these other things perpetrating the same behavior that reinforces oppression. We're going to make these decisions for you. We're going to control everything, and we're going to decide where the greatest needs and the greatest um, where the action needs to happen. When people on the ground are actually developing their own strategies, they're filling gaps because of this flawed thinking and flawed in their poor behavior. Um, uh, and I think the um, the big, two biggest challenges I'm seeing are on the workforce side. To your point about unemployment, um, especially in Boston. Um, the, uh, the, the, the still the um, burden on the health side of things. I know the numbers have gone down, but in the black community, people are still getting sick and people are still dying. Um, and um, we're also seeing um, um, this, this, this black hole of information about the status of black businesses in the area. We have no idea how many businesses are no longer going to be able to open up their doors. And we know that the projections for businesses overall is about 40% of small businesses. Well, 
what is that going to be for the black community because it's always worse right and um and what are going to be our strategies to make sure that we're pivoting people away from um, jobs and businesses that are clustered in these low income low profit industries which that's the pattern before COVID-19 um, to be able to take advantage of the the um, what we've already projected as the, where the opportunities are and where um, we also see um, uh, some kind of in a more innovative thinking that's going to be needed because of COVID-19 and how that's going to impact what those projections are for how where we need to be um, investing in workforce development and small business support for um, uh, businesses of color, especially black businesses in Boston, because that's where the disproportionate burden and impact is right now. So Clement, I would like to maybe uh, shift over to you here on this as well. When we talk about resilience, we, we try to talk about as being about being able to bounce forward instead of necessarily bouncing back, that you can actually get to a, a better place. And that was clearly some of the things that Atia is trying to animate here. What's your, pro what's your sense of the prospect of the COVID-19 allowing uh, uh, the, the South Africa to bounce forward on some of these issues here? Uh, what, what would be some of the things that would be needed to make it happen? Is there any, do you have any optimism that it could be happening? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've been getting a lot of addresses from President Cyril Ramaphosa, our president here in South Africa. and. One of the things that he has constantly mentioned is that we must never miss the opportunity that COVID-19 has given us to make things better and change things. And he has spoken a lot about the economy and how we need to make sure that we transform the economy. And that's what we need to do post COVID-19. We cannot return to that economy that was skewed to favor the minority and not really support the majority of people in this country. So there are a lot of promises that, you know, the president is making, that government is making. There's an economic document um, that has been released by the governing party on how to resuscitate the economy and transform it post COVID-19. So it seems the leaders here in South Africa are using this pandemic to change things. Uh, there are some of the projects that have already started off the ground. If you look at some of the hospitals, you know, we, we now have some hospitals that are being built, uh, filled hospitals. You know, government has looked at de-densifying informal settlements. And these are, you know, communities where people are living in shacks and they're very much closer uh, to each other. And government says in order to allow people to be able to implement social and physical distance and protocols you know they need to de-densify some of those informal settlements so that's beginning to 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 happen um, they're moving people from some informal settlements to other areas where they will have you know dignified housing so um even with in terms of education there are schools that didn't have access to water in, in the rural areas and, and because of COVID-19 and the fact that you constantly need to wash your hands, government has now made it possible to change and build infrastructure in some of those schools to allow for water access for the pupils that are there. So there is some optimism. Um, you know, a lot of people here in South Africa have been asking, why did government have to wait for a pandemic? for them to ensure that there is water in some rural schools? Why did they have to wait for a pandemic for them to realize that our public health system has been collapsing for some time? Um, why did they have to wait uh, for this pandemic to, to realize that you know, there is this inequality in our education system that would never allow you know, pupils and students from rural areas to be able to learn from home, to be able to have the resources and even operate the resources um, that are required for them to be learning from home. So some projects are off the ground. There are promises that government is making and we're really hoping that post COVID, we will be able to bounce forward. And by bouncing forward, that will include transforming the education sector, transforming the economy, expanding the health system so that there is national health insurance. And you know, people who are rich are not the only ones that are afforded and will have access to 
quality health care, but all South Africans will have that quality health care. And hopefully we're taking some lessons from COVID-19 and we'll be able to make the necessary changes post this pandemic. Well, it's, it's, it sounds promising in, in terms of leadership is key in these moments of crisis to leverage yeah. that. I, I wonder if you also have some uh, sort of question that one of our, um, our audience has raised about one concern we, I think we have here in the U.S. is that the, the, uh, the amount of uh, citizen engagement around the equity issues won't be sustained. Are there lessons that you can draw from South Africa uh, about how to sustain um, that citizen call for greater equity uh, that we might be learning uh, here in the, uh, uh, we might learn in the U.S.? So I think what's, it's, 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 some of it is, is, is already happening in the U.S. Um, you know, there is citizen involvement. I think, um, you know, in the, in the last administration here in South Africa, when former President Jacob Zuma was in power uh, for, for about a decade almost, what that was able to do was get people together in South Africa. They were united against the corruption that we are seeing in that administration. That's not to say there, are, there is no corruption in this current administration, but uh, I think we saw it in, in unprecedented levels in the last nine or so years. And what that did is bring people together. So we saw people marching, uh, you know, we saw people actively, you know, answering at the polls. When they go to the polls, they made decisions that was a response to their unhappiness, uh, you know, in a way to how government was doing other things. So I think citizen involvement has been a key thing. Um, the, the role of NGOs has been very critical in holding government to account, in addition to what the media is already doing. Um, and, and, but as, as, I mean, the media can make as much noise as it wants. The NGOs, you know, can also make noise, as much noise as they want. But if the citizens are not getting up and realizing that they have the power and that power also resides at the polls, that then not much is going to change. And I think, you know, the political parties, those in power in this country have realized the power of the masses and they're engaging them a lot before any decisions are taken. Um, you know, the president always speaks about the social compact. You know, whether it's gender-based violence, he brings in people, you know, who are key players in that space, who are survivors of the violence, and sits with them and says, what do you want us to do as government? And I think that level of engagement is helping a great deal in coming up with solutions that are sustainable, coming up with solutions that are going to be long lasting and, uh, and we are going to see the effect of. So I think that citizen involvement has been key. And if it continues, we, we may see it really expediting the change that is needed in this country. Yeah, I, I don't want to put you too much on the spot here, uh, Clement here, but you, you know, looking from South Africa at the United States in terms of how it seems to be coping or not coping with this uh, emergency, both the, the public health emergency as well as um, the, uh, the, the, the reaction to the George Floyd murders. Are, are there things that, that surprise you? Uh, what, what are some of the reactions maybe that you have or that you're seeing that others have about what's happening in the US? So, I mean, what the media and a lot of people, you know, are talking about, what's in the public narrative um, in terms of COVID-19 is, is the U.S. response. And, and a lot of people here and the media, you know, have been speaking a lot about, you know, President Donald Trump's response to COVID-19. Um, so a lot of people have been questioning the level of leadership in the U.S. here in South Africa. They've been questioning, um, you know, the decisions that have been taken there in responding to COVID-19. Uh, and I think that's really what's been the case here when you look at just the public narrative and what a lot of people are talking about when they look at the US. Um, you know, a lot of them say, thank goodness we have leaders that have taken this seriously, you know, that have acted soon and, you know, that have really done all they can to understand the impact of this emergency 
and put in place measures that will help in cushioning not only the financial blow, but making sure that we also, you know, deal with the cases and we make sure that we protect lives as well um, as we protect livelihoods. And in terms of George Floyd, look, the murder of George Floyd has done an incredible thing worldwide in uniting people, you know, against racial injustice. And even here in South Africa, the, there have been the ruling, the governing party, the African National Congress has actually launched a Black Friday campaign where, you know, and that was in solidarity to the, 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 the social movement in the US, uh, you know, that was calling for justice uh, for the matter of George Floyd. So, you know, what's been happening in the US around that civil rights movement has really reverberated here in South Africa. It's, it's influenced and encouraged you know, people to speak out against, you know, racial injustice. It's encouraged people, you know, to also take to the streets and protest. Um, but it's also gotten a lot of South Africans to ask themselves tough questions about our own George Floyd, because George Floyd moment, because we've had incidents where, you know, you know, black people have been brutalized by the system in many other different ways. Um, you know, and, and, and some of the questions that a lot of people have been asking themselves here in South Africa is, why do we always have to wait for a moment to, ha to happen outside of our borders for us to start critically discussing and, and, and talking about the impact um, of racial injustice on, 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 on people in this country? But that movement has really encouraged a lot of people. It's re reverberated here in South Africa like it has across the world. That's very encouraging um, to hear. And Atiya, I, I, I wondered, and from your um, uh, your, your uh, perspective on how we how community organizations are doing. Rick Lemon talked about with the previous administration that a lot that led to change was really this grassroots effort from so many different levels here. So we clearly have some challenges. Um, do you have a sense of optimism about? you know, involving of the faith-based and, uh, and, and other community organizations relative to tackling some of the challenges that you're, you're working so closely with? Um, I, I'm always hopeful because I've seen the ability of people to evolve, grow, and learn. And, and at the root of many of the challenges that we're facing is this lack, it's a, it's a knowledge, skills, and tools gap in being able to, um, kind of um, do several things, um, racial equity literacy, understanding that historical context, what all, what all this stuff is, how it works, how it impacts us, but also our emotional intelligence, our uh, critical thinking skills, our conflict management skills, our communication skills, which are things that we're skills we don't actually learn in school either, right? And so those are things that we then have to help people cultivate and develop. Um, on the community side, I really um, am proud of all of the on the ground work. And, and I just want to say when I talk about community, I don't mean churches, I don't mean formal organizations, I mean people who are on the ground, they might be part of different organizations, but they have come together across all of that um, in order to do um, the more grassroots work. Um, to fill in the gaps. Um, uh, people who have never worked together before, who actually, to be quite frank, don't even like each other, but who have figured out how to work together um, in, for the, the benefit of the community. Um, and I think that for government and other organizations, it's really important that we don't confuse um, organizations that work in communities for the community. Um, they're not the same thing. Um, and um, we, it, it requires more work, but also it's the only way to get the um, most relevant context because they're the context experts. Um, and so even myself as a black woman who um, at, at many stages of my life had to put policies and programs and all types of things together, I never assumed that because I was black, I could speak for all black people. I never assumed because I'm a woman that I speak for all women. I actually still have to learn that there's a there's a spectrum of experiences and we actually have to go and understand what that spectrum is um, and, and be able to, again, match 
what the context experts are telling us with what the content experts are saying. And sometimes that overlaps um, to be able to come with the best approaches and, and solutions moving forward. So I'm challenging us um, in our uh, uh, organizations and our official capacities to know that there's another layer of work that we tend not to do that needs to get done um, despite how hard it is, but the things that are hard to do are the things that are most important to do. Um, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Um, so uh, I think those that's the, the clear opportunity here. Those protests are not one organization or, or churches or any particular structure organization that is um, leading all of them. It's literally by grassroots definition, people who care on the ground who have taken ownership and have rallied other people around them um, and, and um, created the space and took the lead on providing the infrastructure um, to be able to help make these things happen. Um, and it's that kind of collective action that um, is necessary um, in communities and in organizations. Well, very, very grateful for, um, for both Atiyah and Clement sharing uh, their insights from to other to opposite points of the world, but reinforces our mission like at the Global Resilience Institute. And I know very much shares with the World Boston who is hosting this organization today that the resilience imperative is a global one. The equity imperative is a global one. And we do so much better in advancing it when we share each other's lessons. Some of the, them from, uh, the, the, from a past that may be uh, in present that is still complicated and messy. Uh, some that are inspiring. Uh, but one where we need to deal with honesty as sort of core to that here about what we're facing and how we're facing it. But we draw inspiration by comparisons often and being able to have this conversation with you, Clement, today and learn about what you're doing and so what's happening in South Africa to deal with this. And Atiyah, you're sharing your perspectives. I think I certainly come away uh, feeling more inspired about um, the work that, uh, well, there's, there's a lot that remains to be done, but what can be done. So I'm now going to kick it over to our uh, to Sarah to uh, to close the uh, to close the session. Thank you, Dr. Flynn. Very well said, and thank you, Dr. Martin and Mr. Maniathala. I personally could sit and listen to your perspectives for hours, but we have run out of time for questions now, as we want to respect everyone's time, including your own. And thank you to all of you who have tuned in. We appreciate your own call to citizen diplomacy during this challenging time, and hope you will continue to tune into our virtual webinar series. Well, Boston has been running our virtual series since mid-April, and we do have two more opportunities coming up over the next two weeks before we put the series on a pause and we hopefully pick up some virtual IVLP programming again. Next Tuesday at two o'clock, we'll be running an event with more IVLP alumni from 2019 from several different countries who are focused on the evolution of ed tech, particularly due to a pandemic. They will be joined by another local citizen diplomat of ours from Learn Launch here in Boston. Registration has opened on our website and we'll be sending more information by email very soon. And our final event in the series for a while will be with a comedian activist from Israel who was on an exchange here in Boston when COVID-19 forced her to return home where she found herself put into a hotel for quarantine. She will share with us how that experience became a cross-cultural one in her own country and this is a joint event with the Consulate of Israel in Boston, and it'll be at one o'clock on August 5th. And also next week on the other side of programming at World Boston, we have a virtual chat and chatter event on Monday, the 27th at 6 p.m. in partnership with the WGBH Forum Network. Even virtually, the spirit of our chat and chowder series persists. So we encourage everyone to bring your own chowder and beverages, and we will host a 30 minute post chat chat. The speaker will be Mr. Richard Haas, the head of the Council on Foreign Relations. We're delighted to be able to have him with us to discuss his new book, The World, which focuses on essential history and current challenges globalization presents. His full bio and registration are also on our website. So please stay tuned for event announcements on our social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and sign up for our newsletters to stay informed of these opportunities. If you haven't already, you can do so on our website. Your friends at World Boston wish you all to remain in good health and in good spirits. Take care.